In this video, we'll take a look at carbocation rearrangement. So this occurs when there is some energetic driving force to rearrange one carbocation into another. For example, if you go from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary, that the tertiary is more stable, meaning that it has lower total energy. So that secondary carbocation will rearrange to the tertiary because of the energetics, and that is the driving force. It's lower in energy. Now, there's three main ways to do this. There's really only two, but I like to put it into three different categories. As you'll see as we go along, I'll explain why. But the first main category is a hydride shift. So it's important to know what a hydride is. A hydride is H minus. It's a hydrogen atom with a lone pair. This is important to know this difference because a hydrogen atom, on, uh, comparatively to a hydride, is just a hydrogen with one electron, neutral hydrogen. And then there's also a proton, which is H+, plus, which is a hydrogen with no electrons at all. So it's very important to know the differences here. So this is proton, this is a hydrogen atom, and this is a hydride. So for these rearrangements, they are hydride shifts, so you're moving the electrons with the hydrogen atom at the same time in, these, in this type of uh, rearrangement. Next, there's an alkyl shift, and this is when you move a, uh, an alkyl group, so methyl, ethyl, propyl, etc., just some carbon-carbon containing molecule uh, group that's getting shifted to the carbocation. Again, that causes a movement of the, the charge, and again, the reason for that is energetics. And this will make more sense as we do an example. I just want to introduce the, the main types. And then the third type is ring expansion or contraction, but uh, again, energ energetics is what we're describing here. So the rings will expand because larger rings are lower in energy, you know, generally speaking, in the smaller sizes. Now, ring expansion is just a specific case of an alkyl shift because all that's happening is you are uh, shifting an alkyl group that causes the ring to expand, but it looks very different, especially when you're first learning it. So I went ahead and put it in as a separate category just to uh, give an example of the ring expansion and show how that is different and somewhat similar to an alkyl shift. Now, why do we care about any of this? Well, they're, uh, they're critical features. So carbocation rearrangements are very important anytime you're forming a carbocation intermediate. You have to uh, keep an eye out for any possible rearrangements as if there is a more stable carbocation intermediate that can form, it will form, and that will dictate what your product is. So you should always be aware of this, especially in an SN1 type reaction or E1 reaction or uh, electrophilic addition where you're forming carbocations, anything like that, you need to be aware of what is nearby the carbocation because you could have one of these possible rearrangements. And then, like I mentioned, the main driving force for all of the rearrangements is energetics, which just implies that the, the rearranged intermediate has a lower energy than the starting material. Now, this may seem kind of paradoxical because, you know, how can we know conservation of energy? So how can we just have lower energy uh, in a different intermediate, even though it's the same reaction process? Well, when you undergo the rearrangement from the you know, less stable intermediate to the rearranged intermediate, you're going to lose the difference in energy as heat. So, and that will make the most sense in a energy diagram that I will show in a specific example. All right, the first example we'll take a look at is the hydride shift. This is the simplest type of rearrangement. And simply to start, we're gonna take a look at just an SN1 reaction that proceeds through a dehydration of this alcohol, this two, uh, excuse me, three methyl two butanol. And the, the pathway is rather simple to start. You just have a Lewis base, Lewis acid reaction where this oxygen is your Lewis base. It's gonna pull off this acidic proton from the HBr, the uh, hydrobromic acid. This is going to produce water that's still bound to your alkyl chain, so OH2 plus and then you're of course going to produce Br minus as a byproduct here that's lost uh, kind of like a leaving group it's not exactly a leaving group it's just what's left behind when you remove that proton uh, but nevertheless you get Br minus that's going to be important later 
Then the point of making uh, water in the molecule is now this is a great leaving group. So when you have a great leaving group, it is possible for this to just leave. And when it does, you'll create a carbocation at the that position. So notice this is a secondary carbocation. Again, recall, we know that because of we just count the number of carbons that are bound at that position. So it's one, two here. We don't care what's bound beyond directly to the, the carbocation. So one, two. So this is a secondary carbocation. So it's feasible to form. It's not primary, but there is a potential for a hydride shift, which is what's drawn in here. So we have an adjacent hydride which is just, again, remember a hydrogen with its two electrons that we're, we're stealing both of the electrons from that covalent bond as the blue arrow is showing. Those are, both of those electrons are migrating with the proton, with the hydrogen that is moving to the carbocation. So essentially what's that doing, what that is doing is putting a extra carbon hydrogen bond at that position, at this position here. So what ends up happening is the positive charge now migrates to this carbon here on the left because the two electrons that were in this bond have now shifted and nothing has replaced them at that carbon. So effectively that carbon has just lost some of the electrons. So in terms of formal charge counting, that carbocation shifts to this position. Now. Why does that happen? Again, it's energetically favorable because now if we look at this position, it's now tertiary com comparatively to the secondary position here, right? We have one, two, three carbons. Again, we don't care about this one because it's not bound directly to the carbocation. So this is now a tertiary carbocation, which is more stable than a secondary. So once we get here now, we just have, again, another uh, Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction. You could call this more of a nucleophile electrophile if you want, uh, but nevertheless, this uh, bromine negative charge is going to attack this positive charge at the carbocation and create this uh, alpha halide. Now, the reason that this is important to go through is because the major product is this one. It's not going to be where the bromine adds here, and again, it's because this intermediate is lowest in energy comparatively. So we need to, you need to always keep that in mind. Every organic reaction that you're going to look at is going to proceed through the lowest available intermediate that, that the conditions allow for. So in this case, the carbocation rearrangement allows for a lower energy carbocation, and that's going to drive the formation of the major product. Now, you're not going to get none of where bromine adds at the secondary position, but it's just not going to be the majority. You know, maybe 80% or more is going to be this tertiary um, alkyl bromide, and that is going to be the major product. So now recall, I've kind of already mentioned this, but recall the, the stability of carbocations are tertiary, secondary, primary, methyl, and vinyl, and there's benzylic and allylic, but um, those are approximately the same as tertiary and secondary respectively, but um, the benzylic and allylic positions aren't as critical in this particular video, but I want to keep that consistent so when you view this again later, you'll, you'll have the correct list. So this is why the secondary position that we had initially, that's why it's favorable to shift to the third tertiary position here. Now, if you want to look at this on an energy diagram, which I recommend you do as you're first learning it, because it explains a lot of what I'm talking about with this, with this driving force, is Here's the hydride shift step again. Mechanistically, it's just this hydrogen and both of the electrons of that covalent bond are migrating to the carbocation, creating a more stable tertiary carbocation. So energetically, you would start with the reactants, which was just the alcohol that would get protonated and undergo um, the, the dehydration to get to the secondary carbocation here. So there's some transition states and there actually would be an additional one because of the uh, water intermediate, but that's not the main point here. The main point is you're going to go through some steps to get to the secondary intermediate that is somewhat stabilized. It's much higher in energy than the reactants, which makes sense because it's a carbon bearing a positive charge. That's never going to be particularly favorable, but it's stabilized relative to the transition state, meaning it's lower in energy than that transition state. 
but then you can have the hydride shift, which is going to take some amount of energy, very, very small. And depending on the, the specific conditions, it might not take any at all, and it's completely downhill. But regardless, just for generally drawing this, there's going to be some amount of energy that you need that's going to yield the tertiary intermediate which is far more stable, the tertiary carbocation. And you could measure the distance between the secondary and tertiary, and that is the stabilizing energy. Where did that energy go? That's where I mentioned at the very beginning, it's lost as heat. So as this reaction uh, progresses, you would expect to see a, uh, a increase in temperature of the surroundings as the, the heat that was, is lost here, that energy difference between the secondary and tertiary product. And then the bromine is going to bind to the tertiary and you're going to get the products. And I'm just showing this uh, as an exothermic reaction just for, uh, for example. But the main point that I'm trying to illustrate here is the difference between the secondary and tertiary. That is, you can actually measure that difference and that tells you how likely the rearrangement is to occur. Because for instance, you could think, you know, there is this hydrogen over here as well. Why doesn't that hydrogen uh, undergo a hydride shift? And if you think about that, if it were to hydride shift, you would put a positive charge on the primary position, which is then a far less stable carbocation when we look at our, our list here. So that would actually be an uphill reaction. The secondary carbocation is more stable. The primary would be somewhere up here. So that is why that one would not happen. But the tertiary does happen. Again, it's all energetics when we look at explaining why certain intermediates form over, over other ones. All right, the next major type of carbocation rearrangement that we need to discuss is the alkyl shift. This is very similar to the hydride shift in that uh, the both electrons are moving from a carbon-carbon bond now instead of a carbon-hydrogen bond. So uh, to give an example of this, I'm showing again another alcohol SN1 reaction that, going, that uh, proceeds through a dehydration. So again, the initial step is rather trivial. It's just a Lewis base, basic oxygen that attacks this Lewis acidic um, hydrogen of the hydrobromic acid. Then when that occurs, you're just going to protonate the OH to water, and then you're going to lose Br-. minus. So what that's going to look like is this structure here where you have the water protonated OH still in the molecule. Then again, the point of doing this is o water is a great leaving group, so this bond can leave and form a carbocation at that position. When that occurs, you're going to get this particular carbocation, which is a secondary position. And now, alkyl shifts can be very confusing for students, so to try to mitigate the confusion, I've shown all uh, labeled all of the carbon so we can follow where each carbon has gone throughout the rearrangement. So initially I'm just labeling these uh, left to right here, one to four and five and six. So our position here, carbon number three is the carbocation. It is secondary because it's bound to carbon two and carbon four. Those are two giving the secondary intermediate. Now if there was a hydrogen, carbon hydrogen bond to uh, carbon number two, you would get a hydride shift. But that secondary, that, uh, excuse me, carbon number two is quaternary, meaning it has four carbons that are bound to it. So all four bonds are carbon-carbon bonds. When that is the case, the only option that you have is for one of those carbon-carbon bonds to migrate as opposed to the carbon-hydrogen bond. So that's exactly what happens here. This entire group, which is I've labeled carbon six, which is a CH3, that entire thing, entire methyl group is shifting to carbon number three. So this, again, very confusing, so I'm going to be try, try to be as deliberate as possible, but carbon six is this methyl group. So what this is, arrow is illustrating is carbon three will be bound directly to carbon six, leaving you with an isopropyl group, one, two, five, then bound to three, six as a methyl group, and four, another isopropyl group, and the carbocation will migrate to position number two because, again, that position has moved the, uh, excuse me, the electrons have moved from that position and nothing has been used to replace them. So it's just now electron deficient at that carbon. So what this does is yields this structure, which I, I described, but here's actually what it looks like. So we have uh, carbon one, two, and five. 
that's retained here, that nothing has changed with carbon 1, 2, and 5, but 6 has migrated to be bound to carbon 3. So we have 3 bound to 6 now, and 3 is still bound to carbon number 4. Now, look at what happened. It kind of looks like magic, but the carbon number 2 now bears the carbocation. Now if we count the uh, carbons bound to it, it is tertiary, because carbon 2 is bound to carbon 5, carbon 1, and carbon 3. That's tertiary position now. Again, if we think about our energy diagram that I showed for the hydride shift, this is energetically favorable because we've gone from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. Seems rather uh, you know, more difficult to visualize because it's an alkyl shift, but you still get to the same net result. You went from secondary to tertiary, and that's a favorable thing. That's a favorable um, reaction. And then lastly, you just have your uh, nucleophilic bromine. Uh, come in and attack the carbon number two, which bears the positive charge now, and it creates your alpha halide product. Again, this is the major product by quite a bit, but you could get some of the secondary alkyl bromide where uh, bromine attacks at position three. But the main point is anytime you form a carbocation, be careful because you could get rearrangements and the product might not be what you think it is. All right, and then lastly, we have ring expansions, which, like I mentioned at the very beginning, these are just alkyl shifts. They're just uh, special kinds of alkyl shifts, and they look very different from an alkyl shift. So that's why I leave them as their own category, but we'll, I'll show how they are just an alkyl shift um, as we go through this example. So again, to keep it consistent throughout this video, I use just a, an alcohol to start with. So this is an SN1 reaction proceeding through dehydration of the OH. So first you protonate that OH. Again, Lewis base, Lewis acid. It attacks, creates Br minus, which I did not write in, but you create Br minus in this step. Then you have your protonated alcohol, which is OH2 plus. This now is a good leaving group, so it's going to leave, create the secondary carbocation at position number two. Again, I labeled all the carbons to make this as clear as possible because ring expansions are even harder to visualize than methyl shifts or alkyl shifts in general. But here we know that carbon 2 is secondary because it's bound to carbon 3 and carbon 1 and it bears a positive charge, so secondary carbocation. Again, relatively stable, it can happen. Now, when you get something like this, you have an adjacent ring to the carbocation. Whenever you see that, you need to think to yourself that needs to be like alarms going off in your head that there could be a ring expansion here. Because rings that are small, like uh, three, four, five member rings, fives are relatively stable, but if you have a small ring, you can break that ring and create a larger ring, which is going to be stabilized relative to the five member ring. Again, or relative to the smaller ring you know, as a general statement. Again, it's energetics, though, that is driving this. If you can make a larger ring, that's going to be lower in energy than the smaller ring, and therefore, you're going to, it's going to proceed through that because it's less energy. It's less resistance, essentially. So here, there's really two ways to draw this. I showed it as carbon-7, that is binding to carbon-2. You could have shown carbon-4 bind to carbon-2, and it's just the same. Now, because of the symmetry here, uh, the symmetry goes between carbon-6 and 3, uh, well, no, that's not true. This is a five-member ring. It goes between the bonds five and six to carbon three. But regardless, the point is you could use carbon four bind to two or carbon seven to bind to carbon two. Now, again, this is hard to visualize, but what this is representing is this carbon-carbon bond between three and seven is breaking, and both of those electrons are now being used to bind to carbon number two. So essentially, you're creating a six-membered ring where carbon 7 is bound to 2, and 3, 4, 5, and 6 are still together in the cycle. It's just it's expanded to be uh, a 6-member ring as opposed to 5. And then carbon 1 is still bound to carbon 2. So what that's going to look like is down here. So as I mentioned, carbon 7 bound to carbon 2, 7 bound to 2, 3 remains uh, unchanged in terms of the atoms. It has picked up the charge because let's consider what's happened to carbon three. Carbon three has a hydrogen here to start. So there's its four bonds. We're breaking one of its bonds, the carbon carbon bond between carbon three and carbon seven. 
So it's lost an electron in our formal charge counting. Both of those electrons in that bond have moved to carbon number two. So uh, nothing has been used to replace that. So carbon three is electron deficient, just like all the other shifts. Uh, it has lost that carbon is the one that has lost the electrons. Then carbon four, nothing has happened to it at all. Same with five and six. And then seven, we know is still is bound to two. So here we have three that's gained the positive charge. Four, five, six, and then seven bound to two. One is unchanged. So here's our six member ring. This is the ring expansion step. Now this question is particularly good because they notice that we have an adjacent, we have a secondary carbocation that's adjacent to a hydride. So we could have a hydride shift, which is exactly what happens in the next step. So all I did here was just redraw the molecule to show um, carbon number three here, which bears the positive charge without all the numbers, just so it's easier to draw the arrows. So, but here's the adjacent hydride. This will shift now to the carbocation, creating a carbocation at this position, which if we notice, this is a tertiary position because of the three bonds that I just uh, drew over there. So that is favorable. Again, you're going from secondary to now tertiary, which looks like this down here. So this is a favorable reaction, a favorable uh, carbocation rearrangement. So once you get to that step, now you're going to have the bromine uh, Lewis base, the nucleophile will attack that carbocation and create the product here, which uh, again, if you're wondering about chirality, I haven't mentioned that throughout the video at all, but if your final product is chiral, you're going to get a racemic mixture because this positive charge is a planar carbon to sp2 hybridized so the bromine can approach it from above the plane or below the plane and create either a dashed bromine or a wedged bromine depending on the approach which would then create a pair of enanomers assuming there is no other chiral centers in the molecule so however you have to be aware that that's only true if the molecule is chiral in our case the molecule is not chiral here and it was true for all the other ones you can check but there was no um, chirality in any of the others, so we didn't have to worry about stereochemistry. But keep in mind, carbocations that are attacked by a nucleophile will create racemic mixtures if they're chiral. You just have to keep that caveat in mind. They need to be chiral for you to worry about the racemic mixtures. All right, so that is all I have for this video. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. If you have a topic suggestion or uh, any, any topic ideas or any, anything like that, please feel free to leave it down in the comment section down below and I will get to it as soon as possible. So with that, I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.